Thursday, 21st of May, 2020. Jonathan Hammond speaking to you from Norwich, UK. I listened to quite an interesting interview about funding in these difficult times in a Christian context. And it was interesting. And it's all very challenging these days about where do we get the money from to continue the business that we were in? I'm talking about we, but it's not me particularly because I'm not a church leader. I'm not a head of a charity. I'm not working in a charity. I'm not employed by a church or a charity. I'm not hired to do anything. I'm not hired by the government. I'm not hired by the church. God is not hiring me either. So I'm not, I'm literally not a hired hand. So my hands are not hired out for anything. And these are challenging times because if you've been part of a, a, a company, um, a registered charity, a group of people, and um, a money has come in and pays for salaries, and the charity has been helping people, but with restricted funds coming in, the work is restricted as well. So there will be those who have done statistical reports about uh, reduced income means reduced charitable works. But I've also read recently that people are going to Christians, i.e. the church, not the building, but they're going to Christians and more and more Christians are helping, helping the neighbours, helping the community and doing what we can to help people dipping our hands in our own pockets to help them. And the more Christians become active in this church closure, closure lockdown situation than ever. And God's people, we are God's people, but God's people, the church, the people, we're here to help. How can we help? Because a lot of people want money. We're not giving money necessarily, we're giving time, practical help, deliveries and collections free of charge. Why? Because Jesus loves you and wants to help you. So loving our neighbours has become the norm because of the lockdown. Because of the church building closures, the church is the people and more and more Christian people who used to be called churchgoers are free and able to help community and neighbours, family and so forth. Church was never meant to be once a week. But the issue is, according to this interview I heard today on, on Zoom typically, discussing where does money come in from, how to handle money, how to raise money, how to use money. I'm just recording this now because literally five minutes ago I'm driving along going to a supermarket to get uh, some necessary food on a necessary journey. Thought comes to me about chasing after the wind. And this whole process of chasing after the wind is meaningless. And I would suggest to you that if you think money is the thing that's going to keep the church going, to keep us doing good works, because we need the money to do the good works, then I believe you've missed uh, the truth of Christ completely. Chasing money is like chasing after the wind. But you might say to me, or somebody might say to me, that the sailing ship cannot sail without the wind. So a large, let's call it a flagship charity, has income of millions and employs thousands of people, you know, living wage and upwards, and some are volunteers. So without the wind in the sails of the flagship charity, how can the flagship charity continue. 
The issue comes down to hired hands and genuine servants. Many churches have official hired hands, one or two paid ministers, depending on how large the church group is. But many elders are unpaid and they are effectively on call 24-7, 365 days a year. But who pays them? Nobody pays them. Are they volunteers? Are they conscripts into God's army? Well, when Christ saves us, we become servants of God. All the money we have, all the time we have, becomes at God's disposal. We are subjects to the King Jesus Christ. So what are we called to do? We're called to do exactly what we were meant to do before the lockdown, before the church closes, the buildings, I mean, before the, the services stopped. We're meant to love our neighbours seven days a week, 365 days a year, and meeting the needs of our neighbours as much as we practically can. Of course, we're talking spiritually, but also there are mental and emotional needs. There are also physical needs. There's also uh, enabling them to find Christ for themselves, to lead them to Christ, so that Christ on the inside of their life can help them overcome all their addictions. Now, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. We follow Christ. Not because we're Christian, but because we follow Christ. Why do we follow Christ? Christ died for us, shed his blood for us to cleanse us from all sin. And the moment we repented, we are cleansed from all sin. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus says to us, go and sin no more. Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically. The last part of us to come into compliance with God's word of truth, the scripture, according to the Holy Spirit, is self, flesh. Are we under flesh? Are we under law? Or are we under grace? The fact is, your spirit has authority over your mind, your thoughts and your feelings, your emotions and therefore your actions. God has set us free from the once a week church meeting on a Sunday morning for two hours. That was never what God meant about going to church. Going to church doesn't exist. Going to worship with other believers exists. But is that once a week or is that seven days a week. I know what I'm saying to you is impossible for some of you to understand because you're not there yet on your journey of understanding. Obedience is better than sacrifice. So everything you do for God, if it's in the Holy Spirit, in obedience to God, that's worship. If it's good works for God, that is actually sin because it's not faith. Faith comes from hearing God. So if God tells you no more buying and selling in your church cafes, don't want you charging anybody anything for the products. Don't want you buying products. Don't want you making products. I don't want you selling merchandise in my house, says the Father, or from Jesus' point of view, in my Father's house is a house of prayer. It's not for buying and selling. Jesus Christ could not have made it any plainer. Read the Gospels. See how the Pharisees, full of law, they legally owned the temple. The chief priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were the religious government of the temple, of Jerusalem, of the nation. 
Well, the world is full of Pharisees, both governmental and religious. Why? Because it's all about the rules and the regulations. But Jesus came to set us free, not to abolish the law, but within the law, we as born-again servants, disciples of Christ, of King Jesus, we can move about freely within the law. Freedom of movement, freedom to buy food for the day, freedom to exercise, freedom to even talk socially distanced apart with people in the context of our necessary journeys. Exercise, food, buying food, helping people, delivering goods for them, to them. Jesus has deregulated all the religious churchianity. He has technically made all the hired hands redundant. In many cases, the government are picking up the bill on an 80% salary furlough. Nobody saw this coming for society. 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14 have been prophesied 30 years in my hearing in Norwich, but it also applies to the whole of the world now. God has got the attention of every single individual, whether they like it or not, the fact, or whether they like God or not. God is waiting for humility in his people, the church. If my people, called by my name, will humble themselves, repent, seek his face in humility, God will hear and God will heal. Heal what? The land. And what is the land? The world or the church? The people. Judgment begins at the house of God. If I don't judge myself, I'm going to be disqualified. I won't, I won't complete the race. I won't pass the finishing line. I will fall short of God's glory. God says, go and sin no more. I've been discussing today about the elephant in the room. And what is the elephant in the room? What is the blockage? What is the obvious thing that nobody wants to talk about? I'm going to leave that with you, the elephant in the room. Ask God, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you if you've got an elephant in the room of your life. And when you meet other people, is there an elephant in the room that you don't want to discuss and you don't want them to discuss either? Some issue for everybody, it could be uh, majorly different or slightly different. Some issue. Rich young ruler, what was his issue? He had loads of money, but the fact was the money had him. The money owned him, and his whole life was centered around money. So, hired hands, by definition, they are paid, employed by some group, charity, the world, according to the law, minimum wage, job description, contracts, everything that governs the world employment governs the, the employment by any religious group, including Christian church legal companies. None of this really is anything to do with the true nature of the true church, the one body of the one Christ throughout this world. On the day of Pentecost, Peter went out in the power of the Holy Spirit with the others and he preached the truth, the gospel. The Messiah, whom the Father sent into this world, you have killed 
the Messiah. You have killed the Messiah. God's only begotten Son. And the people demanded to know how they could be saved. Well, this is where we are. The, the danger is the hired hands of the denominational legal companies will now reinvent Sunday services online using Zoom and other types of video communication. But the idea was not ever to have a weekly meeting to fill people up spiritually to make themselves feel better and set them up for the week. Meeting together was in each other's houses where two or three are gathered. Jesus says, I am with you. And if he's with us when we gather in our two and threes for real meaningful worship, which is service one to another, which is the service of God to love one another, love our neighbors, reach out to whosoever, That is true worship. When you read Isaiah, there are so many great passages in Isaiah. Search my Facebook page, you'll see all about quotes from Isaiah. One quote you can look at today, Isaiah 58. That chapter precedes Isaiah 61. Now you'll see what the connection is there. The true worship of God is not once a week. Loving one another is not some passive religious ritual. Even praying for one another is meaningless unless you really are praying for one another. Jesus says, whoever's not against you is for you. And that also means whoever's against you is not for you. We're talking spiritually, it's spirit, soul and body. Jesus says if they don't receive you, they don't receive him, Christ. If they reject you, they are rejecting Christ who's in you. This is a time for shaking, for being stirred, for being pruned, and to recognize that God is the gardener and he chooses a good branch in every single person to graft them in to the root of God himself, the cultivated olive tree, Romans 11. If you've been born again, you're in Christ, grafted into the root, who is Christ, John 15, the cultivated, cultured vine of grapes, the best grapes ever, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Nothing of self. It is no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. Why? Because I am reigning myself in. <clears throat> God's Spirit in me reigns me in. And I submit to God's Holy Spirit. And God has put people in my life who have authority in my life, who teach me, even if they don't know, God uses them to teach me. My wife is one. She has the prophetic voice of God and she, by and large, is very seldom wrong and complying to what God is saying through my wife is a mutual thing because there are times she has to comply to what God is saying in me, through me, for her. This is Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 5. Now, <clears throat> every Christian marriage, God is blessing every Christian marriage. He's brought the men back into the home, He's brought the women back into the home. <clears throat> Except for those 
who are part of an essential service, medical or food supply, emergency services, by and large, God has brought marriages of husband and wife back together. A Christian marriage is Christ-centered on the foundation of the rock of salvation governed by the Holy Spirit and Scripture in Christ, in the Father's will. God is making us one. Twos and threes. Every Christian, Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-filled marriage is the church of two. Neighbors are your neighbors. Community is your community. All this jetting around the world to save foreigners. God has brought all the nations into all the nations. Somebody called me a missionary today, and it's true. I'm co-missioned in Christ and with Christ, in the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, to go into all situations and bring Christ into every situation. God bless you, brethren of the one God, his one church throughout this world. One day at a time, one day of salvation at a time, the past is finished, it's under the blood of Jesus Christ. We're in the present, going forward. Isaiah 35, Isaiah 43, 18 to 21, Luke 9, verse 62. Joel 1 and Joel 2 and Haggai 2. Two are all passages the Lord's given me to show us the way ahead, the way forward in the Holy Spirit, going heavenwards in the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit. Just keep telling yourself the past is finished. It's under the blood of Jesus Christ. Be reconciled one to another in Christ because when Jesus comes, it's too late. And that applies to everybody, inside the churches, outside the churches. There is only one true church, the one body of the one Christ, under the one head, King Jesus Christ himself. So, if you believe all this, you can say a genuine amen. I'm going to say God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. If for any reason you can't say, yes, amen, I agree with everything that's been said, then I would suggest to you, you need to talk to God. But what is it, the elephant in the room of your life? The blockage. What is it? That's between you and God. But God is coming, Jesus is coming. The bridegroom for the remnant few is the judge of the many. If you're angry with your brother, you've virtually killed him, killed him off, shunned him, cut him out of your life. Jesus says, as you treat me, you treat him. You, if, if people mock you, revile you, despise you, members of your own household speak against you, undermine you, gossip about you, stab you in the back. This is what Jesus was talking about. Members of your own household, even your own brothers and sisters, mother and father will turn against you. We keep lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. Christ crucified, the incarnate God. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. He's the Lord, Saviour, Master, God, King, Ruler, Sovereign Lord. Name above all names. King above all kings. Sadly, Many of 
the churches of 2019 Christianity, they were governed by their rules and regulations in their religious buildings. There's no going back to business as usual, although many have that mindset already. If your church building opens, it is for the Father's house of prayer for as long as it takes until the Lord, the Holy Spirit, says otherwise. It's not about starting up your concerts, your restaurants, your theatres, acting out the rituals of ceremonies. That was never God's plan, never Christ's plan for his people. We'll leave it there. God bless you, brethren of the one God, his one church throughout this world. Jesus is coming. Hallelujah. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. I'll see you on the way or I'll see you on the day. God bless you. Bye for now. God bless.